Right then, uh, Graham. Obviously, now we're, we're in the actual Widowood Racing Lofts. I know yeah. you did explain earlier the pigeons in here are not the actual Widowood pigeons. They're, they're, they're actually in the other other shed, just That's to right. malt and put back. Yeah. Into the actual Widowood Racing. It's somewhat different to shock the system. So then, when they get back in their own shed, this obviously is a different motivation oh, for indeed. them, and they're not getting bored of the. It's yeah. somewhat unusual what you've told me to what we've seen at other lofts than what we are seeing today. Well, the, is... the reason being is that uh, with, with the, the young pigeons that obviously at the moment now we're in October, it's October the 25th, that uh, they're still going through the malt, the malt and you know stressing pigeons is, is one of the biggest things that can upset a pigeon. So I tend to let them go through the malt and what I do, the, the young cocks that are being brought into the Woodward section, uh, which will be for 2011, I shut off the boxes of all the two year old pigeons. Those boxes are closed. The young pigeons come in and they choose their own box. One of the things is if you put all the Woodward cots in together, you've got the two-year-olds, they've got their own box. If you get a timid yearling, that cock will go and pinch his box. So what I like to do is to get the yearlings in first, let them choose their own boxes, and then once I'm content that after two or three weeks they've all chosen a box, then I'll bring the two-year-olds and older pigeons in. And that way, very little fighting a lot less stress uh, and that's how I, I tend to do the system. I mean at the moment we've got it just as a young bird lot, I've got some young pigeons in uh, from a family, uh, James Gibbon, Jimmy Gibbon, uh, Gibbon son flyer. Kurt Bright, oh absolutely phenomenal flyer, uh, again from Ronnie Evans country up in Sunderland and uh, at the moment this uh, is converted into uh, a young bird loft but when the business end of the season comes around in about three or four weeks time then the yearlings will come in to gain the boxes the cocks will come in later, the older cocks, and basically it turns into a widowed loft. These perches are taken out, uh, the doors are kept closed, uh, and it's a totally different atmosphere and look to the loft. So this really, this loft that's been here 15 years, has, has many different faces to the loft. And uh, like you say, when the pigeons are back in, it's a, re a renewed enthusiasm. Uh, one thing with pigeons is they get bored very quickly. So you've got to do little things all the time. While we're on the subject of Widowood, feeding, uh, obviously people put great store by the feeding, I do too. It's not the be all and end all, but it's another important piece of the puzzle. And one of the things I've found, especially with yearling cocks sometimes, that if you feed the cocks in the boxes, they all have a little pot. It's all very nice, it's all very neat, but sometimes uh, a yearling cock, I say, they're going to go a little bit mad and they're not necessarily getting the right amount of feed. And the other thing is they get what I call grain selective, where if you put a pot of feed into the actual box, they will pick and choose what they want to eat and not necessarily what they need. So what I tend to do, I have hoppers on the floor all the time. In this section, it closes off into 20 boxes. I think next year, I think there's 17, maybe 18, I've not quite decided yet, but there should be 17 or 18 widow woodcocks and they'll be fed morning and night at the times that we spoke about before, but they will be hopper fed and this creates the colony feel of survival of the fittest in a way and they will fight for the corn and they will obviously eat the grains that they need to eat. They don't go selective and also the marder pigeons as I call them that would sulk in a box will come down and join in and uh, for me it's a better method. I think well, what with that method as well One's frightened to death for one game more than other. Oh, so they'll eat, eat that probably extra That's uh, right. half a uh, dessert spoon. Yeah. Thinking they were missing out that yeah. somebody's going to get oh, that before them. See. The, the keenness of the pigeon is pronounced. I mean, a lot of fanciers, successful fanciers, probably do it in a different way. But for me, it's been successful for me to do it this way of actually hopper feeding the pigeon. One of the mistakes people make is having the pigeons too hungry. Uh, the motivation of a pigeon to trap is not because his belly's empty, it's because to the box, as we've talked about the bond of the box, and also the hen. Uh, one of the things with the amount of feed, it's a, it's a fine line again on your daily exercising. If you don't feed the pigeons, you're not fueling them up to give that amount of exercise. So I, I loosely feed, uh, round about I would say every morning, uh, a flat dessert spoon, and an evening sometimes. Again with the temperature, it's, it's a daily thing with pigeons, it may be a heat dessert spoon. But what I want my pigeons, if you can understand this, is that when I go in of a morning, I want the Woodward cocks, if they could talk, to say to me, Graham, where's my hen? Not Graham, where's my breakfast? And if you can understand that, then you're beginning to get your head round how to feed a Woodward cock. Brilliant, Graham. And now, obviously, this loft, what we're in now, you did state you'd be probably 17 Woodward cocks for... Yeah. How yeah. big? 
um, can you explain to the fancy how actual the size of this Widowwood Widowwood loft? So it's obviously to, yeah. to room 17 Widowwood cots quite well, comfortable. Yeah, I, I mean, what I found with this particular loft, it used to be a corridor loft, and I took the corridor out yeah. and then made it into one big section. Now, as you can see yourself and you can, you can feel the fresh air in this loft is, is fantastic. And I'm in quite an enclosed area and I'm trying to invite the air in because we have some trees around the back and various different things. So I'm trying to invite more air in. So the ventilation has been key to this loft. And the actual size of the section is actually eight foot wide, which is bigger than most. I mean, a lot of widowhood fanciers tend to want to have a narrow section. They can put their hands on the pigeons, but that is only a small amount of the actual cubic air capacity. This loft, the success of it is that it's a, a big airspace with very few pigeons in the loft. It's 12 foot by 8 foot, like a box really. Uh, and as you can see with the ventilation, uh, air flows freely. And the condition of the pigeons, the whiteness of the wattles, are very, very rarely have any respiratory problems at all. Even though they are tested once a year, for the last two years they've come back negative from the vet. So it's you know a very important part of the pigeon lofts and it's been a, a successful, uh, so probably, you know, for the health of the pigeons, it's been spot on. That's good, that game. Obviously, I have noticed myself, when you first walk in, you can feel that oh. that air. It's different to any uh, any other lofts and, and anywhere of what I've been to before. So I would imagine in yeah. warm temperatures, oh. uh, in your summer, when your widow yeah. cocks are open tip form, it would yeah. be absolutely perfect. Yeah. And I can yeah. understand why, over the years, 15 years, you've left it as it is, yeah. and it's time so many combine winners from oh. ex-partnerships and even to your present yeah, I mean, at this moment in time. I, I, in the, obviously today, we've, we've got the doors open and uh, we, we've got a lot more air going through. Uh, but what I'm trying to do as well, as, as most successful Widowwood fans will tell you, we've got to keep the pigeons calm. So I tend to close things off a little bit more during the season because we're not darting in the loft, but we're keeping it calm and the atmosphere quiet because obviously, you know, conserving the energy of the pigeon, uh, it's as important that a pigeon can rest as much as it can race and exercise. So part and parcel, really. Another thing is, Graham, while we're on that, that's very good. Um, do you, have you any um, beliefs in eye sign theory, whether it's through racing, breeding, you know, uh, strong eye to a weak eye, have you any beliefs in that? Uh, what I've found over the years, I mean, at one time years ago, you would there would be pigeons of all different eye types, uh, but generally now, a lot of pigeons would say, "I've got nice eyes," whatever that may well mean. For me, I'm not knowledgeable enough to know about the eye sign. I've not studied it, but I do like to see a good strong eye. And when it comes to the breeding, very often I may not be looking to pair too strong of an eye together. Right. I might have what we call a weaker eye with a stronger eye. Yep. Uh, it's something that's, I wouldn't say difficult to explain, but it, again, it's part and parcel of the pigeons. It seems that when people have come round and handled the, the stock pigeons that are, are breeding the goods and, and the good race pigeons, that they've come away saying that that pigeon has got a good eye sign. But the best uh, sign for me is the basket. Well, obviously they say the, it's the winning performance genes, the winning genes. But have you been afraid? Ever been afraid? You know, or, or do you actually keep the yellows together, or a pearl into a yellow, or wouldn't it even? <coughs> would, it wouldn't bother you as long as they were winning performance pigeons. Yeah, I mean, one one of the uh, hens we saw before, Betty Blue, has got a very strong green eye, uh, what people would call a breeding eye. Now the pigeon that she's paired to is a pigeon called Vinnie Jones, and he has a he has a yellow eye, a real wild wild eye. Yet, out of probably eight or nine pigeons that are bred from them, I've only had one yellow eye. They've all been the dark green eyes. So again, it's colours in pigeons and colours in eyes. It, it may be relevant at some point, but generally, it's like with colours with pigeons. If it was purple with blue spots and it won, then I'll go for those colours. So, you know, it, it's 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 a fascinating subject, but uh, one that again is part and parcel with the confirmation of the pigeon, the handling of the pigeon. And a nice eye adds to the, the whole mix. Yeah. What about wing fairies? Have you any anything? Uh, yeah, uh, actually, yeah. And, and this has been brought about really by the Walter Dox pigeons. What we noticed that the last three flights, the outside flights, on a lot of the Dox pigeons and a lot of the winning pigeons were quite thin. Uh, and then as we go further down the primaries, they're a little bit wider. Other pigeons, perhaps the ch some channel lofts have been to, have got very, very wide flights all the way through the wing. So we wondered why why was this and my particular theory, and this is my theory, that with the thin 
out of flight, the, the passage of air is a lot quicker. The generation of the power is a little bit further down the wing and then the three out of flight needs to be moving through the air a little bit quicker than normal. Uh, and to me, the, the, the thinner flights aid that and obviously the gap. And then there's a step up on, on the wing which a lot of fancies talk about. One of my theories really, uh, with the confirmation of the pigeon, is the single tail flight. A lot of good pigeons in my experience, and I've been to various lofts on the continent and in the UK, and a lot of the very good pigeons, especially the spinting pigeons, have what we call the single, the single tail flight. So I have a little bit of a theory. Balance, which we've talked about, is very important. Big pigeons can be balanced as well as small pigeons. Uh, but for me, uh, the only theory is, is the feet theory, and it's the first pair of feet through the trap on a Saturday. Yeah, but what about the actual form of the pigeon on the first two to three flights? Have you anything? Have you studied that, or is it, does it not come to mind? Uh... It doesn't. It doesn't really come to mind because at times, I mean, I've, I've always had the understanding that we're actually dealing with nature. Yeah. Uh, obviously, the pairing of the pigeons prior to the racing uh, and, and the laying of the eggs with the hens does kick the molt in. Uh, I found out though that once they've thrown the first flight, yeah. the form follows soon after that. So obviously you've yeah. noticed that then. If, they, yeah. if they're holding that flight, I'm not happy and, and I can tell that they're not coming into form. But once they start the molt on that first flight, then within two or three weeks I'm expecting high You're results. expecting high results Indeed. coming and yeah. holding that form probably from that first flight to the next two flights. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, we're only having one team of cocks. Uh, form is something that only occurs in a pigeon probably only three or four times a year. Right. Now, uh, I, I do know of a fancy mover Hampton, Jason Hulse, who had uh, 27 Woodward cocks, three sets of nine, and he paired them up two weeks apart each. So there was right. a six week gap. So as one team came into form and then out of form, another team came into form and he could consistently fly at a high level yeah, through the season. Back up through consistency. Yeah, but it's a lot of extra work. Uh, there was a team of fancies there, you know, with uh, with Jason. Uh, all the extra work of the pairing up and the separating. But for me, I'm quite happy to race one team of 18 cocks and let them come into that form and then holding on to the form is the key. And what about the actual uh, the flesh, the skin of the of the keel? Yeah, I do, love, do you yeah. like to see nice pink, pink skin and no yeah. tail or or the, no phlegm in the back of the throat? Are you a big believer in anything like that? Yeah, I mean as we've talked about with this section, the ventilation yeah. it, it tends for me to, it looks after itself. The respiratory yeah. problems are very minimal with the pigeons. Having said that, you can't always see that there is a respiratory problem. Uh, canker wise, three or four races in, if things are not going quite right, you obviously start to look at the different things. I do not change the system in any way, but I may canker the pigeons for two or three days earlier in the week, and sometimes that can bring you know the, the better performances. But generally, on the skin, uh, I like to see clear skin as they're coming into form. Uh, you do get some flakes, but funnily enough, after the bath on Friday, when you're basketing on a Friday evening, you can see the cleanness of the, of, of the flesh. Yeah. And very often, fit pigeons don't have flaky. It's you know when they're coming into form, it's it's tissue thin. And, uh, and you can actually see the veins underneath the skin on, on a pigeon that's in form. 